Um, uh, Libby, you did a great job. Thank you so much. It's impossible to sort of guess uh, how you pronounce my name because I was born and raised in Seattle, Washington, uh, and spent most of my life in San Francisco. Whoop. Uh, can everybody hear me? Because I see that Jay is asking if it's just him. Can other people hear me? I can hear you. Jay might need to hop out and read. Okay, Dan, Dan, and Nigel say yes. Settings. Jay, do the drive. Do the sound driver dance. Um, while we do that, though, uh, I'm just another human on this planet. Uh, I was born and raised in Seattle. Spent most of my life in Seattle or San Francisco. Um, but my grandfather was born in Calabria in Southern Italy. And so my last name is actually Italian or Calabrese, as they say. Um, but that was in 1910 and my whole family has been in the United States since then. So I was raised with it being squillus because most Americans would look at it and go, okay, squill ace, you know, kind of thing. Um, but in fact, somewhere along the line, my father decided he wanted to be more Italian. So he called it Squillacci. And so I spent my whole life pronouncing it Squillacci until I met my wife from Southern Italy. And my wife promptly informed me that I do not pronounce my name correctly at all. It's more like Squillacci. So nobody pronounces my name correctly, including me. Uh, so there you go. Um, I'm going to go ahead and talk uh, about this, but uh, forse Giuseppe potrebbe, um, as they say. So listen, listen. I'm going to go ahead and launch the, the the PowerPoint because I'm a Microsoft person, so PowerPoint's free, and this is what I've been doing for my whole life. Um, but what that means is I can't re I can't see in the PowerPoint display. I can't see the comments. What's really important here is this is a good, uh, you know, we've got a, a good group of people, but it's not huge. And that means we should be informal. So I've got a presentation here to talk about and walk through, but I can um, be driven by questions or interests at any time. And so you should feel free to comment in here or ask in the question in the Q&A section. And like, I, like Libby said, I, I've asked her if she could just interrupt me and she immediately realized that it's a a tremendous joy to interrupt me. So let's let's play with this. So feel free to interrupt me. I'm going to go ahead and start the presentation. And the first part of it won't take that long, but uh, I want to sort of establish a groundwork of why we uh, are in this space that we're in. Uh, and uh, we'll go from there. Okay. So let's see here. If I share a screen, you get Inception. We've tried this before. And there we go. And then I go ahead and you've got inception and then I hide it. And then I go ahead and do this. So in theory, Libby uh, confirm uh, au uh, audibly that you can see the screen. Because otherwise yes, I can't you. see. All right, great. Um, okay, so this is what we're gonna do. It's uh, gonna be quite informal. I am Ross Kulach. I'm a principal program man manager on Azure Core Upstream and that is my team is the Deus Labs team. The larger Azure Core Upstream team handles pretty much everything that funnels into any container or OCI-oriented uh, service and upstream projects. So on the Kubernetes side, that will be things like Gatekeeper and uh, service mesh uh, work. And uh, I used to be the Helm PM for years and years. Um, and various other things, uh, the VS Code Kubernetes extension, which is in the CNCFs, um, interestingly enough. But we also do things like the open source work that goes into Azure Kubernetes service and so forth. And so if that team finds a bug they think is a Kubernetes related bug, they'll, we'll help them do a repro and then we'll take the uh, fix and push it upstream so that everybody can benefit. That way the AKS team can concentrate on the, the actual service and still get a fix right away. And so that's sort of where I sit. Now, Deus Labs is an interesting part of that. We actually only do open source stuff to help uh, fill niches in uh, development that we think are critical for moving forward or doing new work that we couldn't do before. So it's not strictly speaking container work, although, as I say, I used to be the Helm PM. So a lot of it was, uh, still is. Uh, I'm the Porter PM, if you're familiar with Porter and the Cloud Native Application Bundle. 
But if you're not, uh, mostly what I do now is WebAssembly and Kubernetes. Um, and it turns out that's going to involve ContainerD shims. So let's talk a little bit about the agenda, which is WebAssembly, what the heck, because we've got to sort of square the circle, understand why we even care. Uh, Kubernetes is the JavaScript of containers. And by the way, I claim the trademark on that. And I will come and collect royalties if anybody uses it. So please use it, because uh, I need more royalties. Containerd turns out to be, at least for me, the magic sauce. And, uh, you know, I'll, I'll try and provoke Giuseppe later on because uh, he does Kubernetes in, uh, uh, integration in a different way. And, and this is very early days. So it's worth talking about or thinking about all the ways you might do it. And then we can let the yelling begin. We can open it up. But as I said, that's sort of a normal agenda. And this agenda should be interruptible. All right. Just to do, just to set the stage here, um, in the beginning, we used to do native code all over. And then when the cloud sort of started, they were like, let's take a VM because we had things like VMware kind of early on in native when you're in rack space or something like that. There was some hypervisor that was used actually after bare metal. And eventually we got to cloud things and the VMs were the thing that were um, operable there, which meant that the developers were really always delivering native code, which could have, the, the state of which could have changed at any time between when the developer last touched a button and when it was running in, in a VM. And in addition, it would acquire state while it was running. Things would change in the environment, the running environment. And so things like that uh, were uh, troublesome, shall we say, but we worked around them because Basically, if you pay humans money, they'll do all kinds of crazy things. Now, when containers came around, uh, it was pretty clear that they were the greatest things since sliced bread, uh, mainly because you could sort of fix an environment and deliver it. Uh, this is, you know, when you use words like immutability and so forth, uh, but it was also the shareability of it. They were smaller, much, much, much smaller, and they were much, much, much faster, which meant it wasn't just the shareability, it was the pure speed of something you didn't know about. So uh, I always demo when we were doing conferences in, in, in person, and I hope to do this again, uh, I always demo a container that does the matrix, right? Like the matrix screen. Is like, I have no idea how to do the matrix screen. But containers are fantastic because all I need to know is, excuse me, where is a container? that does the matrix and I can call it in and boom, it's on my screen and, it, and it's just fantastic. And you can do that with run times, production workloads and so forth. So containers still are the greatest thing since sliced bread. And that's not really why we're having this conversation. The sort of the reason we're having the conversation is because all was well, but over the last 10 years, the practitioners, I noticed I misspelled practitioners because that kind of stuff drives me crazy. Please insert mentally an I in there. They discovered issues, right? They love POSIX, but it turns out there are other operating systems in the entire world software environment. Yeah, sure, you can talk about Windows, but really it's not just that. There are things like, um, oh, uh, real-time OSs, and there are BSDs, and there are Unixes, and there are all kinds of things. There are new operating systems being built all the time because the environment we work in is always changing. So POSIX is great, but turns out it's not everything. In addition to things like Windows, which is obvious since I happen to work for Microsoft. Um, we also noticed that like architectures ruled everything, uh, but that was not as nice as it seems. So it's really great when you're looking at an AMD 64. Um, it Then if you've got an ARM, it's okay, but then you realize is it Arch 64, is it ARM 64, is it Arch 64, is it V7 or V8? And we're pretty sure that Risk 5 is coming. And is that really going to be the only architecture that we're interested in? It? We don't really know. And so when we think about like hyperscale, like the world we're in right now, and I work for Azure, so think about something like Azure or Amazon or Google or DigitalOcean or Alibaba or OVH. It doesn't matter what cloud you're talking about. That approach tries to standardize the architecture and standardize the operating system so that containers work really well in all of these places. And it turns out it, if you do that, it really does, which is fantastic. But in the rest of the world, it doesn't work that way. And so what you end up having is 
this weird desire to run Kubernetes uh, all over in little environments all over the place. And to do that, you actually have to rebuild all your containers and you have to, you know, if it's an operating system is different, you have to figure out whether containers even exist. And then you have to port Kubernetes to that. And so all of a sudden it gets to be a little bit more difficult. So architectures are an issue. And one of the things that's great about Kubernetes, or excuse me, containers, is that it's really an entire OS, or at least, at least it seems that way to the application. So you can sort of X copy or just, you know, RM the whole directory of the application into a container image. And, you know, you can dork around with it for a while. And almost all the time, except for the most complex environment, you can sort of get it working. Now, that's an amazing bit of flexibility, right? It's absolutely fantastic. But if you notice it, it's, it's, it's an improvement in the ability to take the same code and run it in a slightly better way. But it's still the same code. And so in many ways, you're actually bringing all the old vulnerabilities that you may or may not know about yet with it. And those may include vulnerabilities in other parts of the environment in the image that have nothing to do with the application at all, right? So those scenarios, it's fantastic to be able to dump the code in. But on the other hand, if we start running really critical workloads, how do I know that this image really is okay to run you you might be well aware that there's lots of stuff going on in the world about supply chain and security and signatures and so forth but that problem is so large that even when we get things like the big one we hear about now is s bombs and signatures it turns out neither of those things really solves your vulnerability problem it's merely one step forward in the vulnerability problem right Moving from HTTP to HTTPS was a step in the right direction, but it doesn't, doesn't prevent you from get, going to the wrong URL. You still may have that problem. And it may also be that the URL is by definition malicious. You think you're going to the right URL and it may even be the right URL. And you'll know one thing about that URL is that it is the one that uh, you know, is, is serving um, SSL to you. But that doesn't mean you're not going to get hacked or or uh, extorted or fished or whatever it might be. So the, all the work we're doing right now has to do with all that complex code. It's possible, and I believe it's true, that the way forward for a good chunk of our code, not all by any means, is to actually deliver less of it, far less of it. And part, finally, the last thing was that darn kernel, right? The great thing about uh, container ecosystem is that you were given C groups and namespaces, but you can hit the kernel, the shared kernel. And that meant that you could just needed the kernel to be the same. And that's pretty easy with POSIX and Linux, which is great. Uh, so that was a tremendous benefit. But being able to hit the kernel meant that we've spent the last six years in distributions, both physical distributions and also things like, uh, you know, EKS and GKE and AKS and anybody else's cloud uh, distribution. All of those distributions spend millions of dollars and years of people, people work to, to try and figure out how to prevent you from hitting the darn kernel any way you want at any time you want, because they're either you made a mistake or somebody else deliberately made a mistake. And either way, you don't really want to own the kernel if you've got other things running on it. So they're, 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 these are problems that we live with today, but they don't tell us that somehow containers are bad. That's not what they tell us. What they tell us is there are some things we want to be able to do, right, that we can't do as easily, if at all, with containers. So those people, geez, another typo. They yeared for. I need an N here. It was an I, I forgot, and an N. Okay, I'm going to get them down. They yearn for things like super fast cold start times. So the one thing that Native had is you, you had the ability to start up pretty darn fast, whereas the whole container system was built for sort of like long-running processes in a data center. That's what containers, containers are much faster than VHDs. And in that sense, they seem like they're instant. And for developers, that experience was fantastic. But in, in production, when you talk about like really hosting fast, uh, fast functions, for example, 
it turns out that they're really not that fast and especially compared to native. And so what you really want is how can we get stuff to move faster um, than containers generally do? And if you put the Kubernetes ecosystem around the containers, then the gearing is a two to three second delay, no matter what it is. Uh, that's just the way Kubernetes worked. And it's a good thing for its design, but not for other scenarios. Or is it? That's what we're going to get to. And the other thing we wanted was just pure size. Early on, we thought for sure that the developer ecosystem, and this is very true of the people who were in the Docker ecosystem, including me, um, we really thought that developers would find a Docker file easy. And so what they would do is they would actually develop their Docker files. But that's not actually what happened. What happened was people would code natively, X copy into a Docker file. If they found a Docker file on the internet, they would Google for a Docker file for their particular language or project type or whatever it was. And then X copy in whatever they were working on and then dork with it until it worked. And then they would check that in with the intention that they would go back and optimize the image. And it turns out that in the real world, most people are just working too fast. It's not their fault at all. It's not that they can't go back and optimize the image. It's that they just don't have the time to do it. They've got to go and build another image tomorrow or there's a, a tire fire in their service and boy, whatever their background task was today, it's gone now and it could be gone for an entire week while the service is stabilized. So that results in big containers. So that's the second button there. The size, the containers for small or smaller or constrained environments where you can't scale out turn out to be too big. Even optimized containers are too big. Um, it's just too hard to spend the time to make them smaller. People do, and you can, right? And you can speed up their start times and so forth, but it's just really hard. And now as a developer, instead of working on your application or your business feature, right? You're now working on some little teeny optimization from your point of view that has nothing to do with your service. It has to do with getting smaller or doing for, you know, fast starting. And so it just didn't happen. WebAssembly is an interesting solution here. But before we get there, I just want to point out that size became a problem. Um, for those, I probably, I don't know if I'm supposed to say this, but um, quite frequently people uh, complain about the size of a Java or a .NET container. No, I'm not even going to say the one I'm supposed to say. You can't, you can't drag it out of me. Um, but .NET and Java containers are routinely 500 megabytes to a gig. Um, and that's just because there's a lot of stuff there. I mean, it's just the way it is. If you want to dump a complex Python uh, in there, you're going to bring in so many Python scripts, it's not even funny. Uh, and so even Python, which in theory shouldn't be, or, or Node or whatever, these are big chunks of code and really all they're doing is delivering strings in files. Uh, so it's fascinating. And by default, we want no kernel access. So we learned this because we spent a whole bunch of time doing uh, mitigations in Kubernetes. Uh, I and any number of professionals have spent a good chunk of time doing mitigations, uh, you know, sec comp and app armor and all these other things. And essentially all of those things do is tell, uh, and then of course, uh, you know, trying to get user images and, and not, and not root images. Um, all of this is, is really designed to prevent you from using the kernel or to control which kernel aspects you use. But even if you use a kernel aspect and you're being controlled, if you know a zero day in that syscall, you still own the kernel, even if that is the only thing you've been given permission to. So it's a, a complex problem when by default you get access to the kernel. Well, we don't want, we don't want that. We want to have a whole layer between the kernel and the thing. And so you start thinking about things like virtual machines and VHDs and hypervisors and stuff like that. But those are too big. And so then finally, the thing about containers, which I mentioned before, which relates to the, you know, the kind of the issues that have to do there is we really wanted operating system, architecture, language, and location portability. And by location portability, we mean things like, you know, can you bring the code to the data 
Um, but at the same time, we really wanted all the usual container benefits. We want, um, you know, immutability. We want signability. We want to be able to attach a bunch of metadata that says where it came from and all that SBOM stuff because it will provide value as we go forward. And we want to be able it, it to be able to, you know, do the things that we do with containers. We want to be able to store it in a, some sort of registry um, and, you know, pull it down with the stuff we already have. So that's kind of interesting. So while we were doing this, all of that Kubernetes and container land, there was hostile browser land. And JavaScript becomes slower during that period, clearly the way to program the browser. But then they, in those environments, they're very rapidly understand that they want actually faster stuff because JavaScript is an interpreted language. So the first thing that the browser has to do is have a JavaScript engine that grinds the actual text down to an abstract tree and then spits that out in some sort of intermediate code that can be run in the VM, uh, you know, uh, ground down into machine language and running the VM eventually. And boy, uh, that's fine for popping up a color or a little pop-up and stuff. But if you want to do something really complex, that's pretty slow, right? Okay, so that's one thing they know they want, faster stuff. And they want all the operating systems because why not? They're browsers. They, go, they want to be have a browser on everything. They also want all the architectures because why not? They're a browser. I want to be on everything. And they absolutely have to have, by default, no access to the operating system. So the whole syscall thing is right out. And that's because, obviously, they're being attacked. And so if somebody can get into the process in some way, uh, you know, through the front door, that is through the browser usually, right, they can't be permitted to go ahead and download a script that then goes and, and hoses the operating system. That's very, that's very bad. And then finally, of course, because the more JavaScript you have, the more text you have, and pretty soon your web request slows down and users get frustrated. They have to wait, you know, three seconds to, you know, make a million dollars. And that's very disappointing because you want to do it in like three milliseconds, right? So it has to be very, very small. And there are other reasons, other things that are that have come up in that in during that period, but I'm sort of trying to bucket the, the process in hostile browser land. And what came out of that is WebAssembly. And so if you think about WebAssembly and you're thinking it's from the browser and it's a browser thing, you're sort of right, right? That, that was where it was developed. But before we go somewhere, I want to really kind of talk about WebAssembly outside the browser, right? First of all is the, the, the key elements of WebAssembly that I think are critical. And I'd love to have an argument about this, right? First of all, the, and this deck will make sure we share and everything like that. But the, this is a link to the VM specification. It's a stack-based abstract VM. So when we were thinking earlier, we didn't want access to the kernel and we thought that sounded like a hypervisor or a VM of some sort, you know, some sort of, of emulation and whatever. Um, this is exactly what that is. And you can think of it like uh, the .NET framework. You can think of it like Java VM and whatever it might be. Uh, it is not strictly speaking emulation. It's its own uh, operating system statement. You know, uh, in a way, is a way to think about it, which is why assembly sort of, sort of fits, even though it's not really assembler either. Um, but it's been in all major browsers since 2018 for things like Google Earth and Adobe Lightroom and things like this. In fact, I'm almost certain that this uh, underlying uh, platform that we're showing right now, that's streaming my video to you, almost certainly is built with WebAssembly from browser to browser. Mm -hmm. Right? I don't actually know, but I would lay money on it. So some of the critical things are is that the host in WebAssembly and in, in the browser, that's a JavaScript engine. Um, but outside of the browser, anything could run and in, including a JavaScript engine. Like you can code V8 or SpiderMonkey or any other JavaScript engine to host WebAssembly modules and execute them. All code in that environment is deemed untrusted. And the sandbox in the, the sandbox for WebAssembly is unbroken. There have been um, there are security areas where there, where it's problematic and you have to pay very close attention, but the sandbox itself works. It's, it's not a sandbox problem. And that's really, really great. There are problems that doesn't have, there's no threading. Okay. So you can't think of like, you can do thread pooling and G there's no GC or memory management. And there's a bunch of other things that are not there. Um, 
and it's only 32 bits. So your uh, addressable memory is like, you know, four gigs. Uh, but, and I do want to be quoted uh, as being the first to say, really, nobody should ever need more than four gigabytes of memory. Um, so I'll, you know, claim that one. Most of these things have proposals that are on the way, but they won't be here for a few years. And so the real question is like, okay, so what can you do with it? And what is, you probably shouldn't do? And that's the way to think about it because we're thinking about engineers. The other two interesting areas that I think are critical for what we're doing, especially in Kubernetes and for the, the kind of definition of the problems that, that most of the ecosystems run up against are the WASM system interface or WASI, which is really sort of an abstract syscall spec. So you can think of it as like an operating system, a set of kernel calls, right? Um, but they're virtual. They don't, they're not specific to any particular thing. So they're not posits or anything like that. And the component model, which is a way to create tightly constrained interfaces that define capabilities that the module can perform or requires uh, the host to perform on its behalf. And so there's two sides of a component interface. And the way it works is basically that the WASI uh, syscall set, right, that specification will sit on top of the component model. They'll be component model interfaces. Um, or at least that's the way it's being looked at and discussed right now. Uh, both of these things are in an experimental stage, uh, but progress is uh, healthy and rich. However, it's not moving as fast as like, hey, you're going to get something tomorrow or next Tuesday because these are very complex systems and they have to be optimized for speed and for security. So what do those elements provide? Well, strangely enough, they provide a lot of the problem features areas that we identified as being an issue with the container ecosystem. And so we love containers, but then if we need these particular things, we might have to mix containers with something else. And so when we do that, we look at these categories. Because the uh, host owns the mod module, the host can permit or deny anything it wishes. A module cannot request any feature or any behavior from the host unless the host permits it, right? And the interface model constrains any ability of the module to make calls. So if you have a component and it implements one interface, for example, if you're talking about an HTTP request, the interface might say, I must consume, you know, I implement something that receives a function, one function that receives a, a request and I return that function returns a response and that's it. And if a host implements the opposite side of that contract, right, then that module can be coded to that contract and you can code in any language and you can see that's part of the portability. That means, though, that both the host and the module, right, can only perform that function, which is fantastic. So interfaces constrain the abilities of a module to be to um, to do whatever it wants. So even if a host, if a module has malicious code, even if it, you know, might find a way to invoke uh, a, a call, it can only invoke the call through the interface. And not only is the shape Inter, uh, uh, known by the host, but the host could dynamically inspect those interfaces as well and make decisions on, you know, what kind of content the actual uh, uh, return value had and do something good or bad, depending on what the host decided. The modules have implementations, but they own nothing. And that is a great stance. So the other one is the speed size combo because they're binaries right? And because they're not containers and are optimized for speed, the speed and size combo is amazing. So you can treat it all. It really depends on your workload, but we're talking about somewhere between, hey, uh, a 10x reduction in size to a 50 and 60, 70 redu x reduction in size. That's really amazing. And native cold starts are approachable. So optimized, you can actually start uh, a WebAssembly module and enter a function um, in low nanoseconds. It's entirely possible. But most importantly, it's really important to realize microseconds, low microseconds, is like out of the box. And so the throughput there with the size, that is the module gets delivered very, very fast. You can have density uh, and you can cold start per request a new module. So your multi-tenant location 
of focus becomes the module and not the whole host process, which is very, very advantageous. So now you can start to see why things like Cloudflare and Fastly and Netlify and Vercel and even Akamai does this now. And I'm sure all of the major clouds will do this soon. Um, use this for their CDN functions. That's how they do. Okay, Ralph, we functions. have a question. Yep. Okay, so Nigel asks, so when things like GC threading fully imp implemented WASI networking, et cetera, is there a risk it will bloat and lose some of its superpowers, side speed, security, et cetera? Absolutely. And that is the risk. So here's the deal. Um, the reason I love WebAssembly, the reason I'm betting our company's investment on it and supporting the upstream. So for example, my company uh, is a sponsor of the Byte Code Alliance Foundation, um, which is doing most of the W3C work for the specifications involved here, things like that. Uh, my team contributes to those. But uh, we also support, for example, the, the Python compilations. Uh, we support the infrastructure for building and testing the Python builds to uh, WASI, for example. So we support all that. But the reason all these investments are happening is because the sweet spot for WebAssembly is not to replace the model that containers excel in. So think about it as a sliding scale. If you have no threading, that is, you have one thread, then by definition you're and you have fast cold starts which is what you, which is what you get then by definition what you really want to lean into with WebAssembly is the thing that containers can't really do which is give you multi-tenant per request super fast response times right with super small functions now the container model can't compete you can't create a new container that fast you can technically, but in reality, you can't do it at a democratic scale. Um, so what is the value of the container? What is the sweet spot of the container? Containers, you notice that pods actually are up and running all the time. And that's because they can. And they can do their own scheduling. If you put a web server in a pod, in a container, then create pods and host them in Kubernetes, right? Those, those web servers... They have their own threading pools. They have their own connection pools, all that kind of stuff that was built for architectures like three tier models 25 years ago. And if you think about it, the container model enables us to continue building applications that way. But WebAssembly does not. But the benefit it gives you for not building that way is that you can do all kinds of things you can't do with the container. So that's the... The sort of the dividing line, the super fast, super small, single threaded, do your work and get back to business and create another module for the next work item. If that sounds sort of functiony or serverlessy or uh, microservicey, it should. That leans into that kind of approach technologically. But what happens when you want to actually run a big, long running process as a web assembly? Well, remember, you only got four gigs, so you can't do it now. But if you get 64 bits, now you cut the memory space. If you get threading, if you get async, all the things that enable, you know, concurrency in a large process, like an OS style process, what you're going to end up doing is everybody who knows how to build three tier models and three tier software that is still being built that way. We'll just port the same stuff to WebAssembly. Now, will it be good? Yes. Will it be better? Yes, it will, just in the same way that containers were better than native. Okay. But it is not actually going to be so much better. It is going to be the same code with the same environment. For example, you're going to see, and you already have seen ex experiments with full web VMs. In fact, there's one called webvmi.io, right? Which I think is Chirp's um, attempt at a like a full, you know, uh, a container in or VM in WebAssembly. And the thing about that is, it's fantastic for what it is, and maybe that's the feature you want. So I'll use you, Nigel, as an example. So maybe Nigel, that's the feature that you want, right? I don't want it. I don't want it. If I'm going to run a long running server process that wants all that stuff, right? I'll probably do it native or I'll do a container. Um, 
Maybe I'll do a WebAssembly, but only if I need that WebAssembly to run on any architecture and I don't care about speed. I don't care about any of that other stuff. I basically just want to get the kind of default security and the portability uh, that I get out of WebAssembly. And those may be enough, right? But mm, you're not going to get that for a while. And frankly, uh, if you do that, you're going to still run into the same problem we have with VMs and containers now, which is we have no idea how to secure that entire operating system. And so unless you're going to write code that leans into WebAssembly and, a, and be a binary instead of a co collection of processes with an environment, um, you're going to bring things with you that you're going to end up having to mitigate anyway, even though you're inside a WebAssembly. And remember that those big processes, now you're going to have to open up all the kernel features to the module that essentially start to, at some part of the gradient, start to negate the constraints that the security model of the component interface is, um, starts to bring. So that's not a yes or a no, I guess. It's really an argument for where you should start thinking about the difference. And in two or three years, maybe you want to think about the difference differently, like on that sliding scale. Maybe I will think about it differently. Um, I don't believe so. I believe that the next 10 years of computing must get more constrained. The developers have to be able to do more, but they have to worry about less and we have to ship less code. There will not be faster and bigger chips in all the little devices we're talking about around the world, not floating or not in 5G node towers, not in space, not in submarines, not in ships rowboats, my cell phone, these things are going to get bigger, but they're going to get more electrically efficient and slower at the same time per unit cost. And that will be good. We need them to burn less electricity. But in that environment, you don't want to bring your data center. You want to do something different. And that's how I look at it right now. Did I, is, is, is Nigel, Nigel, is that a good thing? Libby, I can't see the chat. So you get to tell me whether Nigel says thumbs up for now or thumbs down for now. Okay. He says, so clarifying, are you saying you don't expect WASM to get GC threading, et cetera, because if it did, it would lose its edge. No, nope. that's not what I'm saying. No, okay. no, I expect there is a GC proposal. Uh, Dan, I know is, is in, if Dan is still here, he could probably drop the PR for the proposal, uh, the issue for the proposal. There's GC, there's memory management, all the things that people will want are coming. And so what I'm really saying is, you know, Dan might have a different opinion, but my opinion is those features will not arrive in anything uh, concrete before two years from now. And maybe I'm pessimistic, uh, but I actually think I don't want them. I don't need them. All right. I want a new module. I don't want a new thread. That's the way I look at it. Okay, so uh, these are the portability and so forth, and and you know we'll go on. And and you know this is uh, Werner Vogel's doing the uh, AWS thing. Um, very actually, Prime Video bases basically uses WebAssembly right now for more than eight thousand device types, and that's the kind of radical um, portability you get uh, with a single module. That's incredible. And of course, it doesn't mean that the module is the only thing that's on those device types, right? You got to have something that runs it. Um, but the point here is that the, the services job is to make sure that the thing that runs it is there, but the developer only has to think about the package for the process, which is WebAssembly. And it's like you compile to WebAssembly. So it's more like a native process. There is no Docker file to build in, in, you know, for WebAssembly itself. Although I'll show you that there's more stuff to be done uh, to make it work in Kubernetes at the moment. All right, so Kubernetes, and this is my take, uh, part of my uh, hostile provocation, uh, is the JavaScript of containers. And uh, by that, I mean, you don't necessarily like it. You might not have built it that way yourself, but you got it and you use it and so does everybody else. And then they gripe about YAML. Uh, and service meshes and a few other things. Um, oh yeah, so ingresses are not good. And you know, so this kind of stuff, but we use it. 
And it turns out that net, at, at network effect wise in the, in the world, it's incredibly useful, right? So the question is like, what, what do you want to do, right? You want to integrate and people tell us this right now. So speaking from the perspective of Azure, all I hear from customers are, I want to run Kubernetes on my automobile. I want to run Kubernetes in my house. I want to run Kubernetes in my, you know, whatever it is. Okay. And then they say, but like when I try and like run Kubernetes, it's either too big or I don't, I have different machines or like my, I have got ARM and Intel and I've got, you know, various other things. In other words, what they end up saying is some combination outside of the hyperscale environment where everything is the same SKU, you got to choose everything and line up your cluster, a thousand nodes the same way. They're identical. C -c Clusters work great there and containers work great there. The real truth is that Kubernetes is what they want for the control plane. That's what they're asking for. But what they don't know, because they haven't been told, and that's partly my job, um, is that Kubernetes could work in these strange environments where either they're heterogeneous by OS or by architecture, right, or by language, something like that, or they're constrained. They don't have a lot of room. They have flaky networks or very thin attenuated network connections. And they may be like, you know, could barely have any RAM, let alone disk storage and things like this. So the size has to be really, really small. And the performance has to be really, really good for unit of artifact, right? Those environments don't work really well in containers. And like I said, the point here is not that containers are bad. It's that we are talking about compute environments where containers don't really work well. And for sure, and CDN, it turns out that's true for pure cold start and security. So the, all of those environments are WebAssembly. Okay, that makes sense. Those are, those are technological choices, not religious battles or emotional feelings. And so people sit there and think, okay, I want to do Kubernetes, but with WebAssembly. And so there's lots of work here. So, um, you know, Giuseppe's on the line. I know he's done a lot of work. We've been squabbling recently socially um, about uh, C run integration, right? Like, so C run can run containers or WebAssembly, which is a cool way to do it. Or some companies like uh, Wasm Cloud, which is uh, an open source kind of um, actor based model for the most part. They have a microservice orientation, but but the sweet spot for them is actors. Um, they have a Kubernetes integration that allows their actor model to essentially be scheduled from the CRD and you use the CRD and that's their integration with Kubernetes. But in reality, you can use it in Kubernetes if you like the model and you have Kubernetes you know, control planes, but it's really designed to run anywhere and it does its own scheduling and networking and things like this. And so you can do all kinds of cool, uh, you know, transparent networking and neat mesh scenarios like that. So that's one way to integrate with Kubernetes. And the question is whether it's the useful one for you. And it may be if Wasm Cloud is your kind of thing. There are also CRA implementations and Kubelet Im implementations. And I'm going to talk about those in a second. And of course, the interesting thing about WebAssembly is because it can be embedded very, very easily. It's already probably in your Kubernetes cluster. You just don't know it, right? Um, so Envoy network filters, um, except uh, run WebAssembly. And now that's, you know, all the rage. So almost certainly some of your Envoy network filters are WebAssembly based. Um, Cube Warden and a couple others do policy enforcement using WebAssembly. Um, so if you use those projects, you're using WebAssembly and that's there, it's already there. So it, it, it strangely already exists pretty much everywhere, even in Kubernetes, uh, but people aren't conscious about building web assemblies for Kubernetes and just or using Kubernetes to orchestrate them. And that's what we're interested in. And to do that, we use a CNCF project called Container D, which is our magic sauce. And the question is whether it's yours or everybody else's, because as I said, there are tons of ways to do this. So what we did is uh, we failed a lot. And so when I say we, uh, I'm going to call back to my team at Azure, which is the Deus Labs team, and we do open, completely open source. And we failed to integrate Kubernetes in a project called Walk. So if you go to https github.com slash Deus Labs slash walk, 
you will find a CRI implementation and boy, did that not work. And the short version is very straightforward. CRI really is a container runtime interface and it wants to be a container. And so it's very much hard coded, hard -coded to containers. And so when we implement, we were basically faking out all the API calls that are container specific that have nothing to do with WebAssembly. And we realized that the abstraction wasn't there. There were, there, it should really be a compute runtime interface. And so personally, I think we have room for a CRI V2 over the next five years, but it'll take a while to sort of decide how that works because of course, WASM time is not the only runtime that somebody might want to orchestrate with Kubernetes. So then we failed again, but we succeeded with something called Crustlet, which is in CSCF. Um, we don't continue to invest in Crustlet except for to review people's PRs and so forth. There's several people that run with it. Uh, many people use it for the Rust-based um, kubelet and also for the Rust-based OCI distribution uh, crate. Um, so that's something and it's very useful for that. There's also a state engine crate in there called Krator that is really, really good. But the problem with Crustlet is that it tends to treat a node as if it's a special node. And so you actually have to say, this is the node that runs WebAssembly and no other. And that gets to be problematic because we don't need Kubernetes to teach us more things to pay attention to. We need Kubernetes to slowly but surely let us forget about things more and more. I would like in five years for Kubernetes to sort of finally find a default configuration that's pretty much a simple uh, but manageable and robust uh, orchestrator. Uh, we're on that path, but it's going to take time to get there. And Crustlet is not added. That It adds complexity to your operations, um, even if the developers have a, a clear path to using it. So for us, a container D shim turns out to be the right path, the great usage with Kubernetes. Um, container D is the, the, the wedge, the hinge in vanilla Kubernetes between the kubelet, which calls container D API to schedule a workload and the actual implementation of scheduling, which could use different, different binaries. It could make different adjustments. It might do different things and so forth, but container D is just the API facade for an implementation in, inside, which is what we typically call a shim. So for example, Giuseppe, I think run C, uh, C run has a shim. The default shim in Kubernetes, vanilla Kubernetes is the run C sh, uh, shim. I think it's called container D run C. And so we basically use that same functionality to plug in a different runtime, which is Wasm time. Uh, and that's a bytecode alliance runtime. And we then are able to schedule WASI run loads. Uh, it's run WASI, not run WASM. So run WASI does not run WebAssembly only. It has to be conforming to the WebAssembly system interface model uh, and use components in that regard as we go forward. Because the sweet spot is not, let's run some custom module that has custom interfaces to something. If you want to do that, you're more than welcome to grab the shim, including run WASI and, and like actually rip out the innards and modify it and do something custom. But we want to be able to actually enable uh, an ecosystem where WASI uh, impl implementations of WASM components, right, can be used on any, you know, standard Kubernetes interface, uh, excuse me, Kubernetes cluster pretty much anywhere. And it just works. And it all brings the same level of guarantees that I talked about earlier. And so that's our objective there to scale out the possibility that Kubernetes could be used in these weird areas. That's, that's what we're doing there. And, and container D lets us do it. Now there is a little bit of history here and I'm, I want to sketch this out. Um, where are we on, on time? I think we're at uh, what? We have six um, minutes left. That's horrible. It's horrible. I, I was going to do demos. I am a ah. bad person. Um, <laughs> so uh, the critical thing here is that RunWazi, our RunWazi used Wasm time. And RunWazi was forked by Second State because they were working with Docker Desktop and they wanted to use the Second State's Wasm Edge runtime. And so they have a Second State RunWazi, okay? And that is what the Docker Desktop project uses. And then um, our RunWazi, the Deus Labs RunWazi was 
uh, accepted into the Container D project in the CNCF. And second state and Docker immediately uh, sat down and said, hey, let's figure out how to bring composable runtimes to run WASI in Container D. So it's really the same shim. And so we're all working on that together. And then we're also working on OCI compliance and OCI artifacts are on the roadmap. And now I can go to demos, but I'm going to switch gears and come back to inception and basically stop sharing. And uh, yeah, so uh, oh, it starts in five minutes. Oh, no wonder I timed it for this. This is great. So uh, if there are any other you know, questions, go ahead and ask them either in chat or in the Q&A. The chat's fine. But uh, I will do one uh, a quick demo so you understand what WebAssembly really brings. I can also do a quick demo that makes it un uh, helps you understand it in Kubernetes. Everybody vote right now or ask questions. Which demo do we want? We want to see what WebAssembly can do that's really, really important and makes sense that you would want to run Kubernetes cluster for it. Or do you want to see how it actually runs in Kubernetes so you can try it out? Go ahead. If you're still here, even there's 22 that are technically still here, but they have the TV on over here. <laughs> the latter, how it actually runs in case. Okay. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to uh, share the screen. Okay. And then I'm going to jump over here to this and I'm going to show you something I will show at the Docker community all hands tomorrow. And one thing I want to ask is you shouldn't be able to hear anything. Are you hearing audio other than my voice? I no. don't think so. Okay. No. So I'm going to do this. I'm going to go ahead and mute myself so that I don't I can talk over myself. So what I'm doing is I'm showing you uh, K3Ds. And so this uses our RunWASI shim. And so you should think that you would be able to, in the future, do this with the Docker desktop uh, release or any other desktop release. Um, and so we're going to use K K3Ds. And you see right here that what we're going to do up here is we're just calling in the, uh, a shim uh, right here. It's not a shim, a, a container and in K3Ds. The nodes are modeled by containers, and that container has the shim already on it. So we'll go ahead and create how this works. So you should be able to do this, right? In in the deck that we'll share, uh, we'll drop in the, the quick start for this. Uh, but you should be able to find it very, very easily on the web. This is just K3Ds. This is basically real time. So you can start this pretty much anywhere you can find K3Ds. And it, you should have, roughly speaking, the same experience. So what we're going to do here is deploy a two WASM time based applications using Fermion's spin. But before we do that and uh, Deus Labs slight application, but before we do that, we got to tell Kubernetes that the shims exist. And so right there, we've told them there are two runtime classes. And those are the names, one for each app model. Right. And all of a sudden, when we deploy the application, you can see we've got five slight applications and five spin applications. And the interesting thing is we're actually waiting now for a container workload. Now I'm going to stop that and note, we are waiting for the ingress container to load while we have already started every single application, but we can't reach them because there's no network path blocked by the uh, ingestion mounting and execution of the traffic container. So if we sit here and wait a minute, just a second, the container comes in, there it is. So now we can go ahead and start curling. And here I sped up the demo a little bit, uh, but basically I'm waiting for the traffic container to create the local host path. Okay, I've got it. This is just a hello world, right? And so now you can see both of them there, right? So that's one real easy thing from here. I'm going to, so I'm going to show you both curls, uh, but from here you can see, you can do any kind of thing. This is hello world. Now, if I, from now on, now on, this demo is going to tear it down. If I go over here, one of the things I want to show is how it looks in Kubernetes and what you can do. And so here I'm in AKS. 
So you could run this in any cluster, you know, AKS has a service that allows you a WASI node pool service that, that this infrastructure uh, supports. And I've got now two node pools, ARM and AMD. And so I'm gonna actually load a regular uh, container app. It's the voting app. And you can see that it gets scheduled to WASI pool two and it's failing, but there's a reason. And the reason is it's being loaded on an ARM node. Now remember, ARM nodes cost about 30 to 50% less and they consume less energy. So what happens if I do this with uh, five replicas, I'm gonna do the same workloads that I ran on, the, on K3Ds. If I do that with WebAssembly now, they go up. And if you look at Wasm Slide and Wasm Spin, you'll notice that the Wasm pools are essentially evenly distributed. Now for the container app, I have to go back and build a multi-arch build. I have to have, now have two copies of the container, but for the module, it just doesn't care. But there's only one module. I'm like, it's not like there are two or anything like that. And I can demonstrate that, but now I'm gonna go in and choose WASI pool one, which is the uh, AMD version. And I'm gonna delete it right out from underneath the, the cluster, okay? If I do that, now watch, this is not sped up. Terminating the nodes and all the applications are now redeployed. Every single one is now WASI node pool two. And that means that I've just migrated my entire workload from AMD to ARM and it never stopped. There were no, there's no redeploy here for the five that were already distributed to node pool two, which means your workload continued to be serviced and you went ahead and redeployed all the AMD ones to ARM and it happened just that fast. You didn't touch it, right? Kubernetes did it. And all the while the Azure vote, which is a regular container version, right? Just doesn't work because I haven't done the extra labor I need to do in order to migrate the workload to AMD. And it's not that I can't do it. It's not that it's impossible to do. It's just one of those things. And so that in theory, should be good. Um, I'm going to stop sharing. And I want to thank you very much for coming. And then the last thing I'm going to do is drop in that link to the stuff. Well, I'll get it for you. Thank you so much, Ralph. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Did we get the link in the chat? I'm going to get the link right now. Okay. All right. Um, container. There it is. And we go ahead. And this is the quick start right here. You does everything I just did. And I can drop it right in there. And it's a URL. So I hope that works. Perfect. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, everyone. Grab that link before we uh, end our end our session. And um, also, you can probably hit Ralph up on Slack on the CNCF Slack channel. If Absolutely. You, if you need to get any other information or links. And um, thank you all once again for joining us. Thank you, Ralph, so much for hopping in and uh, providing such a great webinar for today. And again, this will all be posted later today on the website. Um, you can catch the recording, all that good stuff. And thank you everyone for joining us. Have a great rest of your 2022. It's time to watch the, it's time to watch the match. Yes. All right. <laughs> Goodbye, everybody. Thanks, Libby. Bye-bye, everybody.